Okay, I said we would be on time and we are. Welcome to our first session of What's Up With My Belly. You all are welcome. I know most of you are seeing it as a recording because of the snowstorm and it's maybe not the best time in the day and not the best day. So please, if you have any ideas of a better day or a better time, let me know. I'm interested to know what time you would like to participate or if you just like to see a recording of what I have to say. I hope you like it. <laughs> okay, let's share the screen and start with the PowerPoint slides. Uh, let me see. There we are. Okay. And off we go. I put me on small and we can see what's up with my belly. And as many of you know, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, already said, all disease begins in the gut. And how right he was. Even if it was more than 2,000 years ago, he knew it already. He uh, experienced it. He observed very well. And we know now know the many connections of the gut with the body. And if you have any of the following, the gut might be your problem. And that is fatigue, brain fog. You're tired all day, can't get out of the bed. Do you have food allergies? Can't eat certain food? Have autoimmune diseases? Diarrhea, constipation all the time? Skin problems? Rashes, allergies, eczema, psoriasis? Or any neurological condition? autism, ADHD, memory problems, even beginning dementia. Are you often down in the dumps? Do you have mental health problems? Are anxious? Even schizophrenia can be influenced. I won't, I won't say you can hear it. Are you in chronic pain that can't be explained otherwise? I can help. So if any of that happens, or you have an upset stomach, uh, inflammation anywhere in the body that can be traced often to a leaky gut or to some disorders in the gut with the gut bacteria and I want to in this series to bring you the newest research and details what's really going on in the gut so you can understand what's really going on in your belly what influences had on anything that you might have, help you understand your doctor or practitioner better if he talks about things, give you tips how to resolve common problems with natural means. For example, I'm just now having a cup of fennel tea, which is very good for stomach upset. Show you how your whole body depends on your gut health and nutrition. And it is so important what you eat. For heaven's sake, don't eat white bread that you buy in the store, it's no good. Even the whole wheat bread is no good. If you eat bread, you have to eat bread made out of ancient grains. Well, we'll come to that in this later time. And you can always question me about your uh, private problems. If you have any problems that can be discussed publicly, please address it in the private Facebook group that I can add you to if you want to. If you have any private issues, send me an email. I always answer emails. And of course, come to the next session of the course, which will be in about two weeks. So this week, we'll talk about what is going on in your belly. What really is going on? And you have to know the structures and functions of our digestive system. Because if we don't know what is where and what it does, how can we understand what's really going on with us that has so much influences on all of us? Alrighty, there is the overview. What is the digestive system? It consists of the head, nose, mouth, tongue, salivary glands, teeth, esophagus that connects the mouth to the stomach, the intestines, the small intestine, the large intestine, with different layers of muscles that propels it forward, with vast vessels, with lymphatic immune system, 
with nerve cells. And of course, the accessory organs, the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. And we'll talk about all of them in a moment. Let's start with the head part. This is a cross section of the head, and here is the nose. And here comes the air in when we breathe, and it conveys a sense of smell. And it also, when we have something in the mouth that we want to taste, we smell it also, and that contributes to the taste. You might have noticed at some point that you had a cold and your nose was all plugged and you couldn't taste anything. That's the reason. So the sense of taste is with the tongue, we come to that later, and the teeth, of course, are used to chew food, to get it ready for digestion, mixing it with saliva to get ready for tasting and swallowing. It is very important that you chew your feet food well, mm, if you can chew it 20 to 40 times. If not, as much as you can, enjoy your food, eat mindfully, enjoy the texture, the temperature, the pleasure of chewing, the pleasure of the taste. We can enjoy every aspect of it. And in the mouth, it actually the saliva starts to digest the food. There's enzymes in saliva produced by the salivary glands and by the tongue. And it also contains antibacterial agents that keep you safe and immune globulin A, which is part of the immune defense. So a very important part. Next, we'll talk a little bit about the tongue. Now, it is said to be the strongest muscle in the body relative to its size. It has taste receptors that are not divided in areas, but distributed all over the tongue. It has sensors for temperature, texture, and touch. So that's why we have such a differentiated sense of taste and smell when we really concentrate on doing that. In the back of the mouth, we probably all know that there's the tonsils, and the tonsils are clusters of lymphatic tissues, so they play a big role in the immune defense. But we can live without them, but it's not that easy, but we can. Now, what are the functions of the digestive system? Just an overview, everything works together. Now we have here mouth and stomach, large and small intestines, and the accessory organs, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. What happens here, you see how it happens. The food goes down the esophagus in the stomach. The esophagus is a big part of swallowing, and the peristalsis is all over the abdomen and the intestines, which is waves of uh, muscle contraction called the migrating motor complex, which you might have heard of, but it happens that the food gets propulsed from the mouth in the end to the anus where we excrete it as food, but it doesn't look like food anymore, as poop, I mean, sorry. In the mouth, stomach, and the intestines happens chemical digestion. We'll get to that in a little. Mechanical digestion is chewing and churning. And of course, the intestines play a big role in absorption of nutrients of all kinds. And nutrients absorption means that the food and the stuff that's in the food gets from the digestive system from the inside of the stomach and the intestines through the intestinal wall into the bloodstream through the liver and then in the bloodstream and everywhere in the body so you see it it has quite a, a way to go from the food to the nourishment of the body the esophagus and the stomach are into uh, parts of the upper digestive system and interesting is here this esophagus is behind the trachea, the windpipe. And here is a little lid that prevents you from uh, getting food in your windpipe when you swallow 
not to fast. When you eat too fast, you talk while you're eating, then it can happen that you get the food in the wrong windpipe because uh, that lid opens up. But the lid can close down and then it goes in the esophagus and it has a sphincter in the bottom that is quite important. And here is also the diaphragm, which is the breathing muscle, but it's only really active when you breathe in the belly. And that sphincter plays a role because it's a stomach and connection to the esophagus. And when the esophagus gets dilated by food, then the sphincter opens, the food gets in the stomach, and then the sphincter closes. And the sphincter closes, that is mediated by nerves, from the stomach and by the function of the diaphragm. And when the sphincter here does not function properly, then we get gastroesophageal acid reflux, the so-called GERD or heartburn. Heartburn is when acid gets in the stomach. So it's not really the acid that makes the heartburn, it's the malfunction of the lower esophageal function sphincter, which can be uh, through nerve dysfunction or it can be through wrong breathing and wrong eating and eating the wrong foods. But there are nice supplements that help for heartburn. For example, there are some that uh, build a sponge that protects the esophagus from the acid. And uh, of course, licorice root, slippery elm, all nice stuff. Even a cup of chamomile tea can help. And of course, so sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. The stomach is here where the esophagus enters in the stomach. And interesting, the stomach has three muscle layers. And the stomach is like a little moon shape when it is empty, but it can increase its size when you eat a large meal enormously. And interesting also and important is that there is a sphincter at the end of the stomach and here is where the food from the stomach after it's mixed with digestive juices and mixed uh, with the secretions and churned and chewed is entered in the duodenum with the first part of the small intestines. Now what functions does the stomach really have? Of course, it mixes and churns food with the gastric juices to form chyme. And the gastric juices produce, of course, we know all about the acid, hydrochloric acid, which is a very strong acid. The pH is around two, which is very acidic. And the stomach cells actually produce a kind of mucus that protects the stomach cells itself from being attacked by the acid. And when you have a stomach ulcer, there's a breakdown of that mucus production that can be a result of an infection and can be mitigated by the wrong foods, stress and all that. But the infection is usually very important and we all know now that it's H. pylori is, plays a big role in stomach ulcers. It not only produces acid, and the mucus to protect itself, but it also produces enzymes to break down carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And that is a chemical breakdown that it starts, and it releases food into the small intestine, duodenum, and it's called chyme there, which is a nice sounding word, but doesn't say much. Absorbs some substances in the stomach. In, for example, alcohol and aspirin gets absorbed in the stomach, and aspirin is a very strong acid by itself. The stomach acid possesses antimicrobial functions, and that is the reason if you do not have enough stomach acid, if you take and acids, especially proton pump inhibitors like Prevacid or Nexium, if you take them for a long, long time, longer than a two, three months, you lose that antimicrobial function and you can get bacteria in the intestinal system, especially in the small intestines where they don't belong. And you can get infections that throw the balance of the bacteria in the gut out of balance. The stomach also uh, produces intrinsic factor 
which is only produced as a dependent required for the vitamin B12 absorption in the small intestine. That means if you have to take stomach pills, especially the protein from the inhibitors, you lose at least part of the ability to absorb vitamin B12 in its original form as cyanocobalamin. So if you have to take them or you fear you need to take them, make sure you take sublingual methylcobalamin to get the B12 in your body. Or have a B12 level check at your doctor, but it's not as reliable. I always would supplement if you have to. Then we'll talk about the three phases of gastric secretion. Now, we know that the sight, smell, or even the thought of food stimulates the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of the autonomic nervous system, which you cannot influence with your will power, like we can our arms, we can move them by uh, exertion, but we cannot stimulate the vagus nerve just by thinking of it. At least most people can. You have to be a yogi, they can. Uh, and the sight smell of thought of food stimulates that vagus nerve, which is a very important nerve, comes out of the brain, goes all through your body and ends in the gut and in the uh, pelvis. And it stimulates stomach secretions just when you think of food. So then your stomach becomes acidic, prepares for to eat food, and uh, then you are obviously getting hungry because there's a feedback mechanism. So then you want to eat all the time. So the best thing is to put your food out of sight. Don't graze all day. It's really not good. I do it sometimes too. The stretching of the stomach also stimulates the vagus nerve. So if you actually start eating and uh, you eat a lot of uh, volume, it stretches the stomach and the stomach secretions get activated by the vagus nerve, which is meant to be, so that's a normal reaction. But emotional stress activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is the opponent of the vagus nerve and inhibits stomach secretions. So that sounds counterintuitive. When, if it inhibits the stomach secretions, how can it make you bad? Well, it makes you bad because you don't have enough acid and you cannot digest your food well. And that has consequences. You cannot absorb your nutrients well, you get malabsorption and you feel bad, you feel down in the thumbs, you feel tired all the time. So that is something that should be addressed. And the stretching of the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, inhibits stomach secretion, which it's meant to be because when the food travels from the stomach to the small intestine, obviously the stomach is supposed to shut down its secretions because you don't want to have the stomach acidic, acidic all the time. Now we go to the small intestine. I put it in brackets because really it's the largest part of the intestine. It's here in the middle. It's called small intestine because the diameter is small, about two and a half centimeter, an inch in diameter. The large intestine, which is out here, is an in three inches in diameter. So that's why it's called large intestine, but it's shorter. The small intestine is about 10 feet long, three meters has about a 200 square feet surface area. And we'll see later why, because the inner layer of the small intestine is folded in folds and builds valleys and mountains. The small intestine mixes food, the chyme, the food mixed with juices, with digestive juices from the stomach produced by the uh, intestines itself and by the pancreas liver uh, with the food and prepares it for absorption. And the gastric juices, which are very acidic, get neutralized by the alkaline secretion of the pancreas. 
which makes it possible to absorb as well acidic stuffs in the stomach and alkaline or neutral uh, milieu needing nutrients in the small intestine. And there's differences there in the intestines. The nutrients are absorbed. For example, iron gets absorbed in the latter part of the intestines, but uh, B12 gets absorbed in the duodenum, but it needs the intrinsic factor. It propels, the small intestine it propels food at a rate slow enough for digestion and absorption. So it plays the major role in absorption of nutrients. Most of or all of the nutrients, which are carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids, and other broken down uh, food products, uh, happens here. But usually the small intestine is mostly empty of bacteria. It does not have many bacteria in it. The bacteria uh, live in the large intestines, most of it. The small intestine absorbs those breakdown products and the water, most of the water, and vitamins, minerals. And now you all probably have heard of the leaky gut. The leaky gut and the healthy gut. The leaky gut starts in the small intestine and happens in the large intestine also. And here on the left side, you see the healthy epithelium. Epithelium is the inner layer of the intestines. These are the cells. And you see they are nicely and tight together and the junctions are closed. And here under the cells, you can imagine there's blood vessels, there's lymph cells, there is muscle, there's nerve cells, and all that. And in, over the cells, they build a mucus layer that is produced by the cells, and uh, beneficial bacteria live here, break down nutrients, and uh, make the... Uh, nutrient absorption possible. In that way, when it's healthy, a high fiber diet helps with that and a lot of vegetables is uh, obviously important. It triggers an anti-inflammatory response. Now, when you have leaky gut, some people when they eat gluten or cow's milk or eat a fat diet high in inflammatory fats like the industrial oils, or uh, fat from uh, animals held not in uh, suitable conditions in mass-produced animals, the poor animals get fed by uh, some garbage that they put in front of them and they have to eat it. And uh, no wonder that the fat that they produce and even the meat is not very nourishing. That can lead to a breakdown of those healthy bacteria in the mucus layer and uh, that brings the bacteria, the wrong bacteria can get settled here and produce inflammatory molecules called lipopolysaccharides and food breakdown products, antigenic material from food can get through those junctions that break down, can get into the bloodstream and into the lower layers where the lymph for it, the inflammatory cells are and the cells of the immune system and it stimulates an inflammatory response and can lead not only to decreased insulin sensitivity, it can lead to autoimmune diseases, depression, even contribute to autism, ADHD, neurological disorders, memory fog, of course, if you're tired, eczema. It all has to do with the gut. Now here on the right side, is a schematic a diagram how the gut looks. This is part of the small intestine. And you see the high valleys and low, uh, low valleys and uh, low valleys and high mountains. And in between is the mucus and hardly any bacteria. And here we go to the larger intestine and you see the lower mountains and valleys and more bacteria and there's immune cells everywhere. Now we go to the large intestine 
the large intestine is, starts on the right bottom side where you know your appendix is, which is a residue for bacteria, which is good, can be good, <laughs> can, it can get inflamed. And it has lymphoid tissues and here ends the duodenum and it has a little valve, the ileocecal valve. And this valve is supposed to prevent the reflux of uh, bacterium rich uh, uh, feces, poop of the colon back in the duodenum, in, back in the ileum, sorry, in the small intestine. And usually the bacteria stay that way in the colon. It goes up the right side, goes across the middle of the body, back down on the left side, makes a little curve in the back and then an S curve, and then it ends in the anus. And uh, what does the large intestine do? Well, it further breaks down food residues. It absorbs most of the leftover water, electrolytes and vitamins produced by stomach bacteria. The food residue is concentrated and temporarily stored prior to defecation. Defecation is another fancy word for pooping. Mucus also eases the passage of stool, that is feces, through the colon. And it propels stool towards the rectum, and then we can eliminate the feces, the stool, when it's opportune. Now the structures and the functions of the colon, we already talked about the different forms, and it holds trillions of microorganisms. We have more cells, bacterial cells in our body than we have human cells. So we are more bacterial than human? I don't know. It's, um, hmm. Leaky guts can happen here too. The colon has lots of lymphatic and nerve cells. It's very important to eat enough fiber that get transported to the colon to get the colon healthy. That has three muscle strands that uh, help with propelling the food. And then the muscles are all involuntary, except for the anal sphincter, which is down at the end and makes it possible for us to determine when we want to release the stool. Now, you might have heard in the news that the mesentery has been discovered as a new organ. Well, we know about the structure of the mesentery for a long time. It's not new. But they have to now classified as, as an organ. I guess that is new. The mesentery is a double fold of peritoneum, which are the cells inside the stomach wall that attaches the gut to the stomach wall. So for a long time, they thought it's something like the trunk of a tree. It contains all blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves ending in the intestines contains fatty tissue, the so important intra-abdominal fat that they may be a bad fat if too much, a risk factor for heart attack even. So that's part of the mesentery and the real function is not well understood. It has probably also hormonal and immune functions and I hope that it's now classified as an organ that will help to uh, make the research a little bit more faster so we learn a little bit more about those immune functions and the hormonal functions. God knows what we learn then. It's always interesting. Science is evolving. What we thought was true 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago is no longer true now. Now we get to the accessory organs, which are the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas. The liver is the second largest organ after the skin, is under the right rib cage on the right side of the body and reaches across up to about halfway to the left. And it has the gallbladder underneath of the liver and all the blood from the intestines except from the rectum uh, goes through the portal vein in the liver portal vein in the liver, through the liver, and then in the inferior vena cava, where it gets redirected to the heart, to the lungs, and in the rest of the body. 
That means everything we eat gets processed by the liver before it gets released in the body. The gallbladder is here and the gall, the bile is produced by the liver and then comes through the bile duct, gets stored in the gallbladder and then flows in the small intestine together with the pancreatic juices. Now, how does it function in digestion? The liver is a metabolic powerhouse. It's the chemistry factory we can really be proud of. It's amazing. And uh, we only talk about its digestive function. It has so many more functions. The liver, when you cut it in a slide, has a hexagonal function, like a beehive. It consists of clusters of cells that are arranged in hexagons. And each corner of this in the outside is a little portal vein where the blood from the intestine comes in. Then it has to go through the cluster of liver cells and then it can go further to the heart and the rest of the body. At the same time, oops, that was too far. At the same time, the liver cells produce bile, which flows out and flows through the bile duct in the gallbladder if it's not needed, or if there's no gallbladder, or if it's needed, it flows directly in the duodenum. Now, it's interesting that the liver produces approximately one liter of bile a day, and some of it is stored in the gallbladder and released in the gut when we eat a fatty meal. Bile is a mixture of water, bile salts, bile pigments, phospholipids, electrolytes, cholesterol, and triglycerides. So not every gallstone is a cholesterol stone. It can be a bile salt stone, it can be a bile pigment stone. It always has to be determined. Uh, the bile has the function to emulsify fats, to make it possible for them to be digested in the watery environment of the bowels. Now to emulsify fats, you probably know that when you have hands that are covered in fat, you put some dish detergent on it and it, you can rinse it off in, with water. The dish detergent acts as an emulsient, an emollient, it emulsifies the fat and makes it possible for it to mix with the water and get out. So I won't say the, gal, the vial is a dish detergent. No, no, no. It would work as it, but it isn't. It emulsifies fat in that way to make it possible for digestion. Now the pancreas, which I call the under and appreciated organ, because most people don't really know what it is and where it is. It is quite in the middle of the body, a little under the stomach, right in front of your spinal column. And uh, it reaches from the left to a little bit past the right side of the body. It has a tail and a head. So it's a little um, like, a, like a cone shaped. And the end has the ending of the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct. The end they end usually in the same area, in a little papilla, a sphincter, that prevents the flow back of the digestive juices and the bacteria from the stomach and chine to the pancreas. The pancreas also has best known for producing insulin and other glucose regulating hormones, that is the endocrine function but the pancreas also produces pancreatic juices. They contain salts, sodium bicarbonate, by baking soda to neutralize the acids, and several digestive enzymes. That is the exocrine function. And this function is regulated by hormones made by the stomach and duodenal cells and the nervous system, and probably also the microbiome. Now, when you look in detail, those little blue areas, those areas in the pancreas produce insulin. They're little islands, really not connected to anything but the bloodstream. And they are called pancreatic island cells, islet, islet, islet cells. 
and the pink little clusters, they are connected to a pancreatic duct, and this gets released in the small intestine. They produce all the enzymes. And like the stomachs, there are mucus-producing cells that keep the pancreas from eating itself. And when anything malfunctions, it can happen that the pancreas starts to eat itself or gets inflamed that way, and that we call pancreatitis, which is very painful and can be deadly, very dangerous. The pancreatic cancer usually starts in the head of the pancreas, which is still a very deadly disease. Now, this is the end of part one of my What's Going On In My Belly series. A recording will be available. The slides, including a few additional slides, can be made available for download if you request it. And keep on, ask me questions via email anytime. And please tell me if another day and time would be better for you to participate. And the next episode will be in about two weeks, and I will be announcing the date and time, as well as some interesting facts in my upcoming monthly newsletter. And now I wish you all a wonderful and healthy rest of the day, and eat some vegetables. Bye-bye. <laughs>